Thank you for the presentation and thanks to the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present our work here. So during my presentation, I'm going to be talking mainly about these three plants, the model plant Arabidopsis thaliana and the two plants of agronomical interest, wheat and tomato. But we have to keep in mind that the physiological and morphological diversity in the plant kingdom is huge, going from unicellular organisms that freely float in the ocean, like Osteococcus tauri, that they constitute part of marine phytoplankton and are responsible for the production of more than 50% of the oxygen that we have in this planet, to flowering plants uh, with different organs, complex uh, developmental programs like wheat that have played a key point in human civilization, acting as uh, staple crops. Uh, there is, although uh, the most fundamental molecular process that all these organisms share is photosynthesis, the process by which uh, these organisms are able to convert the light energy that we get in this planet from the sun into chemical energy to fix CO2 into glucose. During this process, uh, water is used as an electron donor, uh, being split and releasing oxygen into the atmosphere. This uh, event uh, for the synthesis takes place in chloroplast, which are cellular organelle that has evolved from cyanobacteria, photosynthetic bacteria. So therefore, even these uh, simple organisms can be considered as part of this family. Uh, traditionally, uh, these uh, organisms, the plant kingdom organisms, has been divided into plants on the one hand and microalgae on the other hand. But with the recent development of omit techniques, specifically and first uh, genomics, uh, this uh, separation has been challenged. By comparing the genome sequencing of all these organisms, we can establish these phylogenomic uh, families. And what we found is that although there are uh, microalgae or algae that are evolutionary distant from land plants or embryophytes, there was a single event during evolution that gave rise to the uh, group of Biridae plantae, which literally means green plants. And within this group, we have land plants, embryophytes, but we also have two groups of microalgae. Chlorophytes that can be considered like the eldest sisters in, in this group, the elder sisters of land plants, and extractophytes that can be considered the uh, closest algal relatives to plants. So these two groups of microalgae, since they are evolutionary, very related with land plants, they share with them many molecular systems beyond photosynthesis. So we're talking about uh, phytohormones, biosynthesis, phytohormones, sensing, and even uh, the transcriptional uh, controllers of developmental processes and the transcriptional controllers of the response to environmental stresses and also to biotic stresses. So therefore, it was not really a big surprise to find that uh, extracts or derivatives from microalgae have an effect, a uh, biostimulant effect, of, uh, when they are applied to plants or to crops. But the molecular mechanisms that underpin or underlie these responses were not yet characterized. And here is where our group, we are academics, we've got previous expertise in data analysis, specifically omics analysis. Uh, so we were very happy to collaborate with a company that is called Alga Energy. So they provided a biostimulant that was produced from microalgae. This biostimulant is produced at the industrial level and is already commercialized, but they wanted to characterize their mode of action at the molecular level, specifically at the gene expression level. So we developed a protocol that was divided into two different phases. So first, we started working with Arabidopsis thaliana because it's a model plant and it's very well characterized and we have lots of tools to analyze um, the gene expression. And once we identify the biological processes that were significantly activated in this plant as a consequence 
uh, from the biological application, the, the foliar application of the biostimulant, LRM. Then we decided to move to plants of agronomical interest, wheat and tomato, to actually explore that these uh, processes are also activated in these two plants. So we started with Arabidopsis, and as I said, the application of the biostimulant, LRM, is through foliar application, spray, and as a model, as a control uh, sample, we used plants that were sprayed with water. At this point, we didn't know the timing of the response to the biostimulant, so we decided to study the response after two hours from the application as a sort of short-term response, and after 24 hours from the application as a longer-term uh, response. We didn't know either if the developmental stage of the plant was affecting its response to the biostimulant, so we studied the response in young plants before flowering and in adult plants after flowering. And here you have a graphical representation of the results using scatter plots. So basically each dot represents a gene. If the gene is activated, it appears here in red in the upper triangle. If the gene is repressed, appears here in blue in the lower triangle. Here again, we're comparing a control plant sprayed with water with a plant treated with the biostimulant, LRM. So we clearly found a substantial and significant effect at the transcriptomic level. So hundreds of genes were being either activated or repressed after only two hours from the application. This response was maintained 24 hours later, and it was independent from the developmental stage of the plant, because we observed uh, similar effects in young plants before flowering and plants after flowering. When we look at these genes that were significantly activated, we found that these genes are not randomly distributed over different processes, but they were affecting a specific processes, the processes that were more uh, important or of, of more interest to us was these ones involved in response to water deprivation and response to water. To actually validate that these uh, changes that we were seeing at the transcriptomic level actually translate into a phenotypic, that, uh, phenotypic uh, response that can be observed, we also uh, monitor the development of arabidopsis plants under drought conditions. So we separated plants, treated and untreated. At the beginning, they were fully irrigated and treated with the biostimulant, or they only treated with water. Then they were subjected to a prolonged period of time with complete uh, water deprivation, and after that, they were irrigated again. And what we found is a much higher recovery rate in plants treated with the biostimulant than plants just treated with water which actually implies that what we have seen at the transcriptomic level translates into a phenotypic uh, observation. So now that we have identified the stress that is of interest to us, we move to plants of agronomical interest, and we focus on this uh, stress, specifically drought condition. So we started with wheat. Here, besides the foliar application, we also perform application on soils, because the company already recommended that. And again, we compare treated plants with untreated plants. And here, both were grown under deprivation of water, one seed of the maximum retention volume. And similarly to what we saw in Arabidopsis, we found a clear effect. More or around 1,000 genes were differentially expressed. And these genes were, again, not randomly distributed over different processes, but they actually were significantly enriched in response to water deprivation, as we have seen in Arabidopsis. We also found other processes related to metabolism, like phosphate uh, metabolism, and also the acceleration of developmental uh, that were reflected in getting this uh, process aging. Uh, when we look at the individual genes that are activated, we found that the activation is not spurious, it's actually very substantial and significant, and clear marker genes involved in drought response were strongly activated. Uh, specifically, we found that this gene involved in uh, stomata uh, closing, which is the typical response of this plant, of wheat, to drought condition. 
we found transporters, uh, phosphate transported also significantly activated and key transcription factors involved in pathogen response. Again, to check that this uh, gene expression actually translates into a phenotypic that can be observed, we monitor the development of the plants, the treated and the untreated plants subjected to drought conditions. So we found from the very beginning of the development during the tillering phase that treated plants develop more tillers and as they um, develop their programs, we found also during the stem elongation that the plants were uh, bigger and more vigorous and even during the ripening uh, stage. Um, we wanted to also study what happens in the case where we don't get any uh, drought conditions because the initial results we obtained from Arabidopsis were with plants fully irrigated. So we also studied what happens with wheat when it is treated with the biostimulant, but it's also fully irrigated. We didn't do transcriptomic analysis here because at the beginning we didn't see any clear effect during tillering and the stem elongation and our transcriptomic uh, analysis took place during the tillering. But when we let the plants uh, evolve and develop, we found a clear, clear phenotypic during the ripening stage. So the plants were getting bigger and more vigorous. To finish with our analysis, we also uh, quantify the production of grains and we uh, study the morphology of the spikes. We found uh, that under drought condition, the plants treated with the biostimulant have bigger spikes and also they produce more grain. We actually found this very drastic and sort of surprising increase of more than threefold uh, production in plants treated with LRM compared to untreated plants. Similarly, we did the same analysis for plants that were uh, fully irrigated and we compare untreated with treated. And here the differences were not that big. The spikes were bigger but not as much as in the drought conditions. But we also got an increase in the production of almost two-fold increase. These results have been also validated in, in field trials. That wasn't part of our work. Someone else did it. The results are not so drastic and surprising, but it has been reported a more than 20% increase in yield productivity in field trials. So now that we have one plan that is of uh, agronomical interest, where we found a clear effect in gene expression level that actually translates into phenotypic uh, observable uh, situations, we move to the next one, which is tomato. These two plants, they are flowering plants, but they are evolutionary also very distant. So we wanted to see if the effect of the, of the biostimulant is similar, because we found some similarities between Arabidopsis and wheat, but also some differences. So again, we have our plants that are treated with the biostimulant uh, with foliar applications and also applications in soil compared to plants that have been uh, treated with just water. We extracted uh, and we performed our transcriptomic analysis at the beginning of the developmental phase. And we again got a clear effect over the transcriptome with uh, almost 3,000 genes being differentially expressed. Again, we study if deactivated genes were being significantly involved in a specific processes. Um, here, we did not get directly a uh, response to water deprivation. What we got was response to heat. But these two stresses, uh, drought response and heat response, are very much linked in tomato. Similar to wheat, we also got a specific uh, gene activation in pathways involved in metabolism. But here, again, the pathways was a bit different. Specifically, it was like primary metabolism. Uh, photosynthesis from the beginning was activated. We also got alterations in the developmental uh, processes. Whereas in wheat, it was aging in general. 
here it was very specific to the transition from a vegetative meristem to a reproductive meristem. So here we're talking about uh, the flowering transition. Again, we took a look at the individual genes and what we find here is that although both plants are responding to drought, they have different strategies to cope with this stress. Whereas uh, wheat was closing stomata, uh, tomato is actually inducing the production of wax, which actually also prevents water loss, but through a different strategy. So these two plants are different, they have different strategies, but still the biostimulant is activating both of them. So it looks like it is a very upstream uh, regulator. We found key uh, transcription factors involved in temperature response and also involved in the flowering transition that are substantially and significantly uh, activated. Similar to what we did in, in wheat, we monitor the development of the plants and the drought conditions. And from the very beginning, we saw that the plants that were treated were more resistant to the drought condition that they were subjected to. Um, even without the stress, we found that uh, plants treated with the biostimulant were bigger and more vigorous, accelerating their developmental processes. Uh, here in, in tomato, we did not uh, study the productions of fruit. So what, it, what we did instead is to, to study uh, the recovery or the resilience of the plant. So we, similar to what we did in Arabidopsis, we fully irrigated the treated and untreated plants, and we subjected them to a long period of complete water deprivation, and when we see a clear effect in the phenotype, we water both plants again. And here you can see that the untreated plant was not able to recover, whereas the plant treated with the biostimulant was recovering. I had a video here, so maybe they can put it. Yeah. So this is a video we, we recorded just to show how things go. So the plant on the left is the one that has been treated and is able to recover very fast in one single day from the drought stress they have been subjected to, whereas the plant that has been treated just with water was not able to recover. And this has to be because they were able to retain more water thanks to that increase in wax production. So if we go back to the presentation. Right, good, thank you. Uh, so these are the conclusions. First, I would like you to know that Plants and microalgae are not very different. There are two groups of microalgae, chlorophytes and streptophytes, that are very close relative to land plants. That we have developed a protocol that combines first an initial study in Arabidopsis that sort of limits uh, the next stage where we go to study what happens in, in plants of agronomical interest, specifically in wheat and tomato. In the three plants, we saw a clear effect at the transcriptomic level that was translated into a phenotype. But what we saw is that the responses are not exactly the same. The different strategies to cope with the stress are activated, but each plant uses its own strategy to overcome uh, the stress. And we also show that the biostimulant uh, also increases the production of, of grains in the case of, of of wheat. So I would like to thank all the members of my research group because I'm here just as spokesman. They did most of the work. And I would like also to thank thanks the, the funding agencies. And um, thank you for your for your attention. I'm willing to take any questions. We we do have time for questions. So any questions from the audience? Yes, please use the microphone. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. I'm Eric Cinegara presenting Quizda Agro. And uh, this is uh, how do you see this uh, new type of biostimulator in the content of, uh, of a normal seaweed product? Because this type of product will compete for sure in the market sooner or later. So what is the benefit of that uh, approach uh, uh, if we compare the benefit of the normal seaweed application? Uh, well, are you talking about biostimulants developed from microalgae? Uh, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Uh, so the seaweed and the microalgae, uh, 
How do you see in, 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 in practice? Please also use your microphone. Sorry. If you're asking me from an economic point of view, I cannot really answer that question because I'm not an academic. What I can tell you is that microalgae are evolutionarily very distant from, from plants and their composition is very different. For example, the, the, the amount of proteins they contain is much lower in microalgae than in, in, than in microalgae. So, and the systems are different. So they do not share uh, similar uh, signaling molecules. So I would expect, I would expect that extras from raw microalgae have a stronger effect than microalgae. But then this uh, cost of growing microalgae compared to microalgae, I don't really know the, the answer. Uh, I know that the, the, this, my, uh, this company grows then at industrial level and they have a cost-effective procedure for doing that. And it, but I don't know how the microalgae people do it. And, I mean, I really like microalgae, but I'm not an expert on them. Maybe codium, but that's it. Yes, I see a question there. Please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Okay. Isabelle Boulogne from University of Rouen in France. Um, two questions, if it's possible. Uh, the first one, it's not really clear for me why exactly you use Arabidopsis while there are reference genome for wheat and tomato. Yeah. And well, the second one, all right, right. <laughs> and I'll let you after. Um, it's a more bioinformatic tools question. Uh, can you tell me what kind of tool did you use for your pathway analysis? Perfect, thank you very much for your question. That's a very good point, okay? Uh, so the plant community is very focused on Arabidopsis. Uh, it's true that we have the genome sequences of other plants, like tomato and wheat, but the functional annotation, which means that the information that is associated to each gene in these new plants that have been sequenced, like wheat and tomato, they has been inferred based on what we know in Arabidopsis. And that translation of the functional of a gene in Arabidopsis to wheat is a bit uh, tricky. So, of course, it's useful, but you don't need just the genome sequence. You need a reliable functional annotation of the genome. And in that situation, you have Arabidopsis here and maybe tomato here, but all the other plants are lagging behind. Because to actually characterize functionally a gene, there needs to be a lot of research done there. So still Arabidopsis has an advantage over all the plants. You just don't need the sequence of the genome, you need the fully annotation. And regarding the technical aspects about how we process the RNA-seq data, we use a mapper that is called HiSat2, we assemble the transcript using a string tie, and then we use scripts developed in R to actually compute differential gene expression with d 2 and similarly. Also in our group, we develop tools that sort of uh, make easy the analysis of this data. So you can go to our web page and you can check them. Right? Okay, thank you. Thanks again.